That's us. Just want to unmute us. Uh-huh. Mm. Uh, because Elvin, Elvin, I told everybody said that he said he was gonna call you, so let him know that the house is gonna rain. So he's he upstairs. Uh -huh. It's better to deal with it if you say no, it's definitely but I may ya mo y me pregunto you like Mary's gonna check into that. Um, uh, let me ask you quickly, did the dog stay in the cage last night? There you go, okay. Okay. But he said, you know, that, that he, he was in the cage most of the time, so. Mm -hmm. There's Janet. Hi, Father. Good evening, everybody. I see you. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Father. How are you? How there are maybe you? some people. I'm well, thank you. Okay. There may be some people here I don't know. I'm Father Bill Waters, an Augustinian, and a pastor here at St. Augustine Parish in Philadelphia. We're very happy that you're with us this evening. This is our eighth session of doing everything you always wanted to know about something. Uh, and tonight we have uh, Dr. Janet Haggerty. Uh, Dr. Haggerty is a uh, professor at St. Charles Seminary in Theology. She's been with us before and I'll, I'll allow her to introduce herself. Uh, she can do that a lot better than I do. Whatever you want to tell us about Janet, about yourself, who you are. And tonight she's going to tell us about why Jesus had to die. Janet, <laughs> yeah. thank you very much for being with us again. Well, I appreciate the invitation. Um, as Father said, I've uh, been um, an instructor at St. Charles for a number of years. Um, we're all getting ready to move at the end of this semester. It's very difficult. Can't believe it's real, but... I've been trying to, I've been in denial about it, and it, but it's really <laughs> getting harder to deny it when things are getting packed up and uh, closed down. And so I guess we're actually going. It has, has to be very emotional for you. Oh, yeah. And and for the, the fathers for whom it's home, I mean, I, it's bad enough just working there, but for many years, but they live there and, um, no, oh, it must. It's just awful. All the both chapels are closed now, and um, and they're just splendid. They were. They're just the whole place is just splendid, and to to um have to, to walk away from this is uh, very difficult. <laughs> so um, you know that's where I um that's the only interesting thing about me is um any association with St. Charles. <laughs> and um, how long have you been there? How long have you been there, Janet? 
Um, I first arrived, I got into Kinto the Math Affairs in 1992. Oh, wow. So, I think like 32 years now. Well, yes, it's well, it, is it, is, it is it is emotional, sure. Yeah, it's ter terrible. <laughs> it's uh, oh my gosh. Um, and um, so I have um, variety, I, I do a dogmatic theology and spirituality courses, and um. You know, I'm, I'm very grateful that I've uh, been allowed to be there <laughs> all these years. It's a wonderful place to work. And wonderful. It just, it's not even like work. You know, it's just such a pleasure to be there. Well, thank you for being with us. Well, I certainly, it's my pleasure. All right. So I guess we're ready. Yes. Okay. Um, so the topic is that I was given is um, to answer the question, why did our Lord suffer and die? It's pretty much the heart of the matter, isn't it? <laughs> um, the short answer to that question is that he suffered and died in order to conquer suffering and death. Um, that is the answer. I don't know if it tells you much at the moment. But um, hopefully by, by, by the time we're done, maybe there'll be some clearer understanding about that. He suffers and dies in order to conquer our suffering and death. So as I'm sure you know, anybody of faith would know, um, our Lord's um, suffering and death are directly related to sin, to the fall. Of, you know, we wouldn't have the Redeemer and the redemption were it not for that. Um, so, look, what we're looking at, what we want to address is how does our Lord conquer suffering and death with suffering and death? It seems, it would seem like it should be conquered with the opposite of suffering and death, but it's not. And the other issue is, what does it mean to conquer suffering and death when all we see around us is suffering and death? What, what can it mean to say that he conquered it when it's still here? So um, I'm going to try my best to address these two mysteries. Indeed, they are mysteries. How does he conquer suffering and death with suffering and death? And what does it mean to conquer them when they're still here? Um, so we, we, we know that, um, you know, we have the mission of, we have our Lord and the mission of redemption as, uh, in relation to the fall and to man's sin. Um, it's the mission of redemption that our Lord carries out is, his, is, uh, his response to our sin and the suffering and death that it causes. It's very, um, you know, uh, remarkable when we realize, you know, when you look at the fall at the beginning, you know, there in the beginning of the Bible, um, man was given everything um, that he needed to live in paradise and to um, make the move that the father ha would have us make, all the graces that were needed. And when we failed in that, the remarkable thing is, the response that God the Father has, um, he says, well, in, in response to this um, failure on your part, I'm going to give you more. He's not going to take away uh, what he gave us. He's going to, he responds by giving us even more than what he gave us. And the more it, eventually we come to see is his, is this, his son and the mission of redemption. I think that's an important point, uh, an in, uh, revelation of who the father is. Now, there are some very false ideas um, concerning the redemption that I hope none of you have that you're not burdened with. I run into them um, kind of a lot. Uh, one false idea is concerning why our Lord suffered and died is the notion that God the father's wrath toward man's sin was unleashed on his son so that he wouldn't have to unleash it on us. 
Um, and then, then another false idea is that um, because man owed, because of sin, man owed a debt to the father that he couldn't pay. And then our Lord came to pay the debt in our place to appease divine justice and square us with the father. In both of these views, the father looks like such an ogre. And he and um, that's not what we see our Lord reveal the father to be. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that you're not burdened with either of these notions. Um, but they seem to be common ones that we could do without. Um, okay, so we know from Genesis that um, uh, uh, suffering and death are the consequences of sin. They weren't there in creation. We don't, they don't become an issue for us until after the fall in Eden. Um, so let me mention a few things about that, a proper understanding about that. Um, in, um, um, in the Eden, the Garden of Eden, the uh, material creatures na did naturally die, like plants and animals, they did die and decay. And because man had a, has a physical body, he, we were naturally subject to death. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wouldn't only have been a sin related thing. Um, death would have been a normal part of our human existence. But the reason we weren't subject to death was because of a grace. If without that grace, we would have been subject to death. And that, that wouldn't have been because of sin. It would just be because that's what happens when you have a material body, like the plants and the animals. They were subject to death, uh, and we would have been too, except that there was a grace that preserved us from suffering and death. And after the fall, we, we lose this grace, and so now we are subject to death. And uh, concerning suffering, um, a body will feel pain from a stubbed toe, even in paradise, even before the fall. But suffering is of a different order. They're not really the same thing. It, suffering includes pain in the body, but it's also and more so a mental and a spiritual reality. And man was preserved by grace, again, from the mental and spiritual aspects of suffering that would normally accompany pain. So we have to make a little distinction between um pain in the body and then a much more serious um, experience called suffering. And so there was this grace that the father gave us to preserve us from suffering and death at, be at the beginning. And then with when sin enters the picture in chapter three of Genesis, uh, man loses these graces um, that preserved us from suffering and death. But we also lose a lot of other things. And most importantly, we lose the good relation that we had with the father in paradise. And when it comes to the mission of redemption, it's all about that relation with the father um, that we lost. And you can see that with the, when you pay attention to the gospel, you can see that our Lord is constantly addressing that. It, it, it's all about the father with him. You know, it's always um, in one way or another. I came not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Um, my food is to, to do the will of the father. He is that that's it's pretty clear that this relation between him and the father is central to the mission of redemption. And the reason is because when sin entered our lives in, in the third chapter of Genesis, not only did it usher in suffering and death, but it also um, profoundly wounded our relation with the Father. And that's what our Lord came to um, heal. Um, so let's see, uh, just a few points about um, how, um, what things, what was going on in Eden um, to help our topic here. Um, we weren't intended um, to stay in Eden indefinitely. I think that's a popular idea that that was we were 
created there and we were supposed to stay there indefinitely. But no, Almighty God had gracious plans for Adam and Eve and for all of us. We were created not for just an earthly paradise, but for a heavenly paradise. Um, so Eden was good, but not as good as it gets. We were intended, always intended for heaven. Like we say now, you know, we, we know that heaven is a, a, a reality for us. We hope to go, we hope to find ourselves there one day. Well, Adam and Eve too, and then all their offspring, if from the very beginning were intended for heaven. We started out in, in uh, earthly paradise, but we were intended for heavenly paradise. But nobody can be forced into heaven. Wouldn't be heaven if you were forced. Entering heaven has to be done freely. Freedom is um, an important feature uh, in all of this. Um, and the, the free act that man needs to make um, in entering into heaven is um, the laying down of his life. It's, um, it's not merely a matter of um, choosing heaven. You know, this wasn't the issue with Adam and Eve that he was, the father was just waiting for them to choose heaven. The free act that was needed for them to enter heaven was to lay down their lives. Um, but laying, you know, if, if it was just a matter of choosing heaven, I mean, who wouldn't choose heaven? But laying down one's life takes some consideration. And it should sound, you know, with that wording, it should sound like um, it's not an easy thing to do. Laying down one's life, it never is an easy thing to do. But that was, the, that was what was needed to get from the earthly paradise into the heavenly paradise. Um, so that's all put in place right there in the first couple chapters. We see Adam and Eve um, receiving a command from the father. He tells them to eat from all the trees of the garden, except for one, lest you die. Now, up to this point, they lived in love with each other and with the father, obeying his will and his instructions easily because they understood them. And it resulted in a contented and well-ordered life. But this command not to eat the fruit was different from what they had known. And what the father really was saying to them was, will you be faithful to me concerning this fruit just because of who I am and because I ask you to, even though the reason, um, the reason for it is not clear to you? Up until that point, obeying the father's will was a, just a natural um activity on their part. But when it came to this command, um, it wasn't like the others. The father was asking something different. He said, will you do this? Will you be faithful to this command just because of the relation we have with each other, just because of who I am, who you know me to be, and because I ask you to? Um, so obeying this uh, command not to eat the fruit could have been just as natural to them um, were it not for Satan's involvement. He's the new um, uh, character that we see there in chapter three. The most damaging thing that Satan did to them and to us is to instill distrust, distrust of the father in Adam and Eve. Satan insinuated, you know, when he's talking to Eve, he insinuated that the father was not all good and was holding them back from their best selves with this command of his. He was keeping them down, keeping them ignorant. Satan made eating the fruit look good. But eating the fruit wasn't the father's will. And that was all that matters. Because that's what he, that's what the father um, asked them. Will you do it, even though you, you may not understand it, but just because of who I am and just because I'm asking you to. It, his will was very clear. So 
Satan's making the fruit look good, but it's not the father's will. And that's, that was what they were uh, presented with. They should have, what should have happened was they, Adam and Eve should have sought refuge in God's will, even though Satan's argument may have been more compelling. They should have entrusted themselves to the goodness of God that they had known up until then. It would have been hard for them to do this. Um, you know, Satan was making a strong argument. It would have been hard for them. It would have cost them everything, in fact. And it would have meant laying down their lives to be faithful to the Father's will at this point. But remember, that's the free act that was needed to enter into heaven. The lay for man, the laying down of your life. And had they been faithful to the Father's will, that's what it would have amounted to. It was very difficult. This, I mean, sometimes it might seem like not a, you know, we don't understand why they failed in this. It doesn't seem that hard to us, but it actually was very difficult. Um, there's more to it than meets the eye. So the bottom line is it would have cost them everything. And by that, I mean the laying down of their lives. Um, Satan's temptation gave Adam and Eve the opportunity to trust the father in a way and to a degree that they didn't have before. And that's what he was asking them. That's what he was he was at, um, giving them the ability to do so that they could carry out that free act. Um, and so great a free act would this trust have been that it would have allowed the father to take them from Eden into his house. Um, but we know <laughs> that didn't happen. And so th what we see in this scene, the, the first thing that for our purposes tonight is in this scene in chapter three of Genesis, we are introduced to the first two ways to die. There are three ways to die, possibly four, definitely three. And um, our Lord conquers all, all of those three. I'm not sure he conquers the fourth one, but he certainly conquers the first, the three. Um, and in this scene, we, um, we see the, we're introduced to the first two ways to die. And so when we were addressing why does our Lord suffer and die, we, we need to know all the ways that, that all the possible ways to die. So we get a fuller picture of, of what went on in his death. Um, first of all, let me ask, did Satan tell the truth um, when he told Adam and Eve that they would not die if they ate the fruit? He said, if you eat this fruit, you won't die. God the Father said, don't eat that fruit lest you die. And Satan said, if you eat that fruit, you won't die. Was he telling the truth? Did they die after eating the fruit? Well, um, the, the usual sense of death, you know, when I say die, the thing that comes to mind right away, of course, is physical death. You know, the one that we know is in our future, the separation of body and soul. Um, did by after eating the fruit, did they drop dead on the spot? No, but death was now part of their lives and our lives, that preserving grace that they had was lost. So they didn't drop dead on the spot, that kind of death, the physical death. But in another more important sense, they did drop dead on the spot. And here we see Satan's lie. Satan can't tell the truth ever. He's a liar and the father of lies. They were guaranteed that he wasn't telling the truth. And so when they ate the fruit, it, they introduced the physical death was now a part of their existence and all of ours. But there is another way to, di to die that happened immediately. They dropped dead on the spot. And, and here is where we can see Satan's lie. And that is the second way to die. So physical death, separation of body and soul, that's the first way. The second kind of death, though, like when, you know, when we say that they um, 
drop dead on the spot. How could that be? I mean, they were talking and um, blaming and making fig leaves and breathing. What could it possibly mean to say they, they dropped dead on the spot? Uh, and yet when we say that they, the, they lost that grace that they had, that preserving, that grace that preserved them from death, from suffering and death, they lost that, you know, with the sin. And so th this kind of, uh, the second kind of death is called a spiritual death. And it, it can also be described as the death that sin causes. So you have physical death, the separation of body and soul. And then you have this other way to die, a second way to die, the death that sin causes. And, you know, our, our faith teaches us that um, sin does bring death with it. Um, there's a reason certain sins are called mortal because something's dying. You're, when you lose sanctifying grace, which is what happens through mortal sin, we die spiritually. Um, the sanctifying grace is the grace that makes us holy. That's what sanctification means. Sanctity means holiness. So when we lose sanctifying grace, um, which is the grace that makes us holy, um, there is a real death that comes with that. And this second way to die is more serious than the first. Like, might not seem it when you're thinking about, you know, the physical death that awaits us all, but um, it is much more serious. Um, the first, the natural dying, you know, that's part of our human condition, but the second death, the second way to die, the death that sin brings, um, that can result in the loss of eternal life, the loss of heaven. Um, you know, our Lord says uh, somewhere in the gospel, um, you know, if your hand offends you, cut it off, you know, better to enter into heaven with one hand than go into Gehenna with two hands. Because, you know, it, it's much more serious. The second death, the loss of heaven and the loss of eternal life is far more serious than uh, the physical death that we know is coming. Or if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Better to enter heaven with one eye than go with both eyes into Gehenna. So I think he makes it very clear that of these two types of death, we have both, um, but the second one, the spiritual death is more serious. So, but both types of death are now part of our condition, our human condition. Both of them bring suffering with them and both of them are conquered by our Lord in the mission of redemption. So you would wanna look for both of these types of death being conquered on in the Paschal mystery, not just the, the physical death. Okay, so that leads us into um, our next move is how are these deaths, these two deaths conquered by our Lord along with the suffering that comes with them? They always go together, suffering and death always go together. To address one is to address the other. Um, the so, so preliminary point here, that I, to be mentioned is um, the son of God becomes man while remaining God, of course. He becomes man by assuming human nature, as you know. Um, he assumes the human nature of Adam after the fall. It's the, it's the human nature that belongs to mankind after the fall, although it doesn't have the sin in it. It's that fallen human nature, but it doesn't have the sin in it. Why doesn't it have the sin in it? Well, all the rest of us, when we um, are created, we have the fallen human nature. We all have the fallen human nature now since uh, the fall of Adam. And, and of course, with the sin, the, the, the fallen nature has some other aspects to it. One of them is the sin, original sin. But there, our Lord, although he, he assumes the human, the fallen human nature, why would he, that might sound wrong to say that, but um, 
when you think about it, I think you, I mean, that's the nature that needs redeeming. If he doesn't assume that nature, it's not going to change. We can't have some other kind of nature because the fallen human nature is the one that needs redeeming. And that which is not assumed is not redeemed. So <laughs> he assumes that one, but he doesn't assume the sin. Our Lord is sinless, radically sinless. But why doesn't he have sin in his human nature? That is thanks to his mother, right? That's thanks to the Immaculate Conception. Our Lady um, conceived without sin doesn't transmit sin when she conceives our Lord. That's why he has the human nature from her, but not the sin, because she doesn't have the sin. So she can't give it to him. I think this is all by design. Um, now he wants this nature, this, um, fallen nature that we have, um, for one reason, it's really not doing him that, uh, um, any good, but the reason he wants this fallen nature is because this is the nature that can suffer and die. The very, the two things we don't want, we're stuck with them because they're part of our human nature now. Well, our Lord seeks out uh, this ability to suffer and die. Um, he, these are the tools that he uses to redeem us. These things that we loathe so much. His, of course, in being God and his divine nature, he's, it doesn't allow him to suffer and die. We don't, you, you can't, we don't speak of God as suffering and dying. Um, but we do because of the fall. So the reason he wants this fallen human nature of ours um, is precisely so that he would be able to suffer and die. And this is good news for us because after all, suffering and death are two of our big problems. So if he avoided them, he, his mission wouldn't have done us any good. We need we need the redeemer to take on suffering and death. That's our two of our big problems. So the good news is um, he finds a way to do that by assuming our by becoming man and assuming our fallen nature with the ability to suffer and die. Um, okay, so our theme here tonight is that our Lord conquers suffering and death by suffering and dying. Now, we might expect that him to conquer them by using something other than suffering and dying. I mean, if we were designing the mission of redemption, we probably would use the opposite of suffering and death. Um, but when, if you think about it, there are some precedents for his approach. Uh, you probably remember um, in the Old Testament, when the uh, Israelites left Egypt and they uh, entered into the Exodus, and that long, long 40-year trip to the Promised Land, at one point in the Exodus, the uh, Israelites were being bitten by seraph serpents. They were dying from the bite of the snake. And uh, Moses, you know, took the problem to Almighty God. And what was the solution there? Um, the Lord commands Moses to fashion a bronze serpent, if you remember this, and put it on the crux of a tree. Make a serpent out of bronze and put it on the crux of the tree. And then all who look upon the bronze serpent were healed of, their, of the snake's venom. So, I mean, that wouldn't have worked except that God allowed it to work. But the point here that uh, we, we, want, we don't want to miss is that the poisonous snake is conquered by another snake. Um, and we, I, I'm going to describe that as the problem being turned into the solution. The snake was the problem. Now another snake is the solution to the problem. Um, so, I mean, that I'm, I would, I'm hoping to try to illustrate how can he conquer suffering and death with suffering and death? And there are some precedents for this. I think vaccines kind of uh, are the same idea. We, we, when we get a vaccine, we're injected with some of the very sickness that the vaccine is supposed to protect us from. 
So the problem, the sickness becomes the solution to the problem. Um, and I think um, wildfires, if I'm understanding correctly, are sometimes stopped by a, a controlled fire. That's why I think that's where we get the expression fighting fire with fire. So you would think a fire, the only way to handle a fire would be with something like you know, the opposite of it, water. But no, sometimes one fire is conquered by another fire. And so once again, the problem is turned into the solution. Um, now, when we think of conquering a problem or an enemy, because the language that we use is that our Lord conquers suffering and death with suffering and death. So it's that word conquer. And yet, what do we see all over the place? Suffering and death. So I, I have a, f a feeling that it, the understanding comes down to the word conquer. Maybe we don't understand how he's defining that word because it doesn't look conquered. You know, suffering and death, since they're all over the place, it doesn't look like they've been conquered. So, and yet that's what we say that in the mission of redemption, he conquered them. So either we're just not going to ask any questions about that, but just, you know, pretend that it's not a problem, but that's not going to do us any good. So I think we need to understand what the word conquer means. Um, when we think of conquering a problem or an enemy, we usually mean to subdue it or imprison it or to obliterate it. Clearly our Lord did not eradicate suffering and death or replace them. So what he did do is much more remarkable and mysterious. He conquers suffering and death by putting them to a new and unexpected use. He takes suffering and death, ours, and turns them against, uh, uses them against sin. He uses suffering and death to vanquish the enemy that sin is. He uses them to carry out his victory over sin. Because that's what we're seeing in the Paschal mystery. We're real, we're hit very starkly in the face with our Lord's suffering and death. Um, we know it has something to do with sin. And we say on Easter that they he has um, carried out victory in his suffering and death. He has been victorious over sin. I don't know that I mean, we say it and believe it, but um, sometimes it might be hard to see where the victory is. So ultimately, um, I want to try to show that he conquers sin with sin itself. He's fighting fire with fire. Because when sin is turned against itself, it's completely defeated. Um, probably most of you saw the uh, movie, The Passion. Um, you know, it just, you can't, it's, it's hard to take, but um, it's, it's um, quite powerful. And there's a scene there toward the end where Satan, you see Satan in the pit of hell. He's, he's on his knees in despair, I think. He's not on his knees praying, I know that much, because he realized right after our Lord expires on the cross. Satan, the utter frustration that, uh, is portrayed there is fabulous because because it's true it's theologically true satan realizes at that point that he has played directly into our lord's hands he thought he was getting the upper hand on uh, this crazy mission of redemption but he realizes that once our lord dies he realizes that he has played right into his hands in carrying out uh, the mission. Um, it's just like, it, you know, it's something similar there with, um, you know, Pilate and um, the chief priests, you know, um, their um, idea in putting our Lord to death was to stop him, um, you know, to stop every, all his followers, to stop his, um, what he, the message, stop everything. Um, and, you know, it's significant when our Lord was speaking to Pilate, um, 
you know, he wasn't answering him. And Pilate says, why aren't you answering me? Don't you know I have the power of life and death over you? And our Lord says, you would have no power over me were it not given to you from above. Um, and, and elsewhere, he says, somewhere else in the gospel, our Lord says, nobody takes my life from me. You know, this isn't a murder going on where his life is taken from him unwillingly. He, nobody, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. And it's significant that he uses that language. He lays it down freely. The very thing that Adam and Eve and me, me and my sin do not do. We are, we're all going, being called to lay down our lives, that free act. So our Lord stresses, no one takes my life from me. This is at another part in the gospel. I lay it down freely. Um, and so where the chief priests and Pilate think that they're in charge and calling the shots and putting our Lord to death, he, they are also playing into his hands. He's using their um, ill will, <laughs> this is way I can put it, to carry out the mission that he wants to carry out. Because remember, he took on that fallen nature of man because he wants to carry out the, his mission through suffering and death. So they allow him to do it through their ill will and their conniving and everything that went on and the lying and everything that went on that brought our Lord to death, all the uh, false charges and everything. Um, they were actually playing in, in his into his hands and he's the one calling the shots at all times. They don't see that, but we see it now. Um, they were, they allowed him to, they brought about his death and allowed him to carry out his mission and his victory. So um, how does he do this? You know, how, um, how is it that he is um, turning sin against itself in order to complete it? How is he um, taking suffering and death and using them against sin? Um, so um, turning the problem into the solution. He does it um, with the third way to die. So we've seen the first two ways to die. Now we can see we had the first two ways to die since Genesis. Now we're seeing our Lord introduce the third way to die. And this is the death that love brings. So we, we have physical death. We have the death that sin brings, also known as spiritual death. And and now we have the death that love brings. Um, so on the cross, let's see if I can uh, demonstrate this. On the cross, uh, our Lord is not just suffering and dying as an act of solidarity with us. Oh, you, my people, suffer and die, so I'm going to suffer and die just like they do. That's what I mean by an act of solidarity. That's not what he's doing. I suppose that would be very nice, but it wouldn't be redemptive. Uh, it is not just the act of suffering and dying that redeems us. I don't know why it would. I mean, <laughs> he would just be in the same sinking ship we're in. Now we suffer and die. Now he's suffering and dying. That's not redemptive. Um, so it's not just the act of suffering and dying that redeems us. It's the act of sacrifice that redeems us. I mean, a person can suffer and die and it not be a sacrifice. And that's tragic. That would be very tragic for a person of faith. It would be tragic to have suffering in your life and not using it as sacrifice, just wasting it. It would be it would be tragic to die um, and not as a sacrifice. It, it, they don't. It, the, the sacrificial element isn't automatically there. Our Lord puts it there. So it's not just the suffering and dying that redeems us. It's not the act of just the act of suffering and dying that redeems us. It's the act of sacrifice that redeems us. It's the sacrifice of his will. It's um, the sacrifice of his life. Like he says, I came not to do my own will. That's always the case, not just then when he said it, but his whole incarnate life. He's not doing his own will. He's doing the will of the father. Again, the thing that Adam and Eve did not do. They ended up doing their own will, right? Instead of fidelity to the will of the Father. 
Um, it's the it's um, an act. This is his sacrifice. Is the act of love and trust in his father that he's manifesting here. Um, so the, the sacrifice that he's carrying out by means of suffering and death. They're the means by which he carries out the sacrifice, but the focus should be on the sacrifice. Because that's at the heart of the mission. He, Almighty God can design the mission of redemption, you know, any way he chooses, but he chooses to do what's best. And so it all comes down to the act of sacrifice and the means by which he carries that sacrifice out is suffering and death. If you can see the difference there. There's, you know, sacrifice of his will, sacrifice of his life, not my will, but your will. It's always a matter of that, not my will, but your will, no matter what it entails. Um, and it's his act of love and trust in the father. The very things, but my point here is all the things that Adam and Eve were being asked to do and had the ability to do, but didn't do. And then in our lives, whenever we sin, we're repeating that. It's my will, not the, every sin, all of them. It's, it's always a matter of not your will, I'm gonna do my will. It's not trust in you, I'm gonna trust in myself. Um, it's all just a repeat of the same theme. So our Lord is um, addressing all of that, not just Adam and Eve's failure, but the failure of all of us who keep doing the same thing. Now, what makes our Lord's suffering and death different from ours? Vastly different. Um, his, is, his suffering and death are not the consequence of committing sin. So we know we have suffering and death in our lives as the consequences of sin, a sin that we inherit, you know, from Adam and Eve. So unlike Adam and Eve and unlike all of us, his suffering and death are the result of his trust in the father and the father's unfailing goodness. Adam and Eve failed to trust. When I sin, I failed to trust in the Father and the Father's goodness and his track record of goodness. I'm failing to trust all that. And so this, my suffering and death come from that failure. But our Lord's is very different. His suffering and death are the result of his trust in the Father and the Father's unfailing goodness. So it's... It's his isn't the consequence of sin, of committing sin like ours is. So our Lord takes hold of the suffering and death that we cause by sin, and he uses them as the means to love his father. <laughs> I mean, I'm not using them to love the father. I have suffering and death because I'm refusing to love. But our Lord takes hold of our suffering and death and he uses them as the means to love his father. Imagine, this is that turning the problem into the solutions idea again. He repurposes suffering and death as the means of carrying out the father's will. Because the father's will is for this sacrifice. And so he uses our suffering and death that come from sin as the means to carry out the father's will. He's using them for a vastly different purpose than what we were using them for when it comes to sin. He's using them for faithfulness and for love of the father, not for rejection of the father. So now when he takes hold of suffering and death and repurposes them as the means of carrying out the father's will, so they're no longer just the consequences of rejecting the father's will. Like they had been up until this time because this is the father's will, this uh, sacrifice of the son, you know, how it says, you know, the father so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. This, this um, sacrifice of the son is the father's will. We always have to see the father and his goodness behind all this. Our Lord would like that because he came to reveal the father. We tend to just see him, but he makes it very clear in the gospel that he came to reveal the father, not himself. He who sees me sees the Father. Um, and so 
the 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 love behind this sacrifice is the love of the father um and so he you know um wills it is his will that the son carry this out for our sake and so the son is um carrying out the sacrifice through suffering and death as the means by which he does the father's will and loves the father quite the opposite of the origin of suffering and death, which is sin. And so in our Lord, we see the death that love brings. His dying is, his suffering and his dying come from love. It's also, um, you can describe it as the death to self. Um, I think we probably um need both of these expressions the death that the third way to die the way that our lord gives us which is the means of conquering the first two ways of dying is the death that love brings the death to self that love brings so he lays down his life in sacrifice of love to the father's holy will using the suffering and death belonging now to human nature to carry out the sacrifice. He's using the suffering and death to carry out something much bigger, to carry out, um, to carry out a sacrifice and to um, carry out the Father's will. And so this is how sin is turned against itself and is conquered. Um, and that's the, the key here um, is um, one of our uh, missions was to, how should we understand the word conquer? You know, um, it doesn't, he's not conquering suffering and death in the usual sense of that word. Like we would like it to mean that he eradicates it. <laughs> That's how we usually use the word conquer. That's not what he's doing with it. That's why you see suffering and death all over the place, because he's conquering it in a different way. Um, and I think he makes it clear in the gospel um, that he desires us to do what he did. So the fact that the suffering and death is still here means we have the opportunity to do with suffering and death what he did. We can take the suffering and death in our lives that come from sin Um you know, the, the death that sin brings, and we can use them the way he did. He, we can repurpose them and use them in, to carry out a life of sacrifice filled with acts of sacrifice for the Father's will. Um, we would be doing, it's clear in the gospel that he desires us to do this, not in addition to him doing it, or alongside of him, but only through, with, and in him. Our, to try to do this on our own would be pitiful and could be done anyway. It has to be, easy, if we do what he did and use the suffering and death in our lives, turn it into the, the death that love brings. We have, we have daily opportunities to do this. Our lives are filled, and people we care about, their lives are filled with suffering and death. We have daily opportunity to make of this the death of that love brings, you know, to make a sacrifice of it. And this is our participation in the conquering of the death that sin brings. Um, and there's we're never lacking in this opportunity. Um, he in the gospel and he says all this um he makes it clear in the gospel you know before the paschal mystery because he can't he's busy um he can't spell it out then so he spells it out ahead of time during the three years of his public life and spells it out over and over again in, in through the apostles in the church but we hear him say things like he who loses his life for my sake will save it it's, a, it's important to take our Lord's words seriously. He really means them. None of it is um, exaggeration or poetry. 
So when he says losing my life, he's talking about a way to die. And you don't want to say, oh, well, he can't really mean that. It's not can't be a real death. It's a real death. And the death that love brings is a very crucifying death, too, if you've ever tried it. Um, it's going to cost you everything. Remember, you know, with Adam and Eve there in the beginning, um, they were being asked to lay down their lives. Um, and it would have been it would have cost them everything. It would have been very difficult. And they didn't do it. So now we have daily the opportunity uh, to enter into the death that love brings, to lay down our lives in sacrifice in, as our participation in, in our Lord conquering the death that sin brings. So we, along the way in his public life, he tells us things like, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Um, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains a single grain and not much work, not much use. You're not going to get full on a single grain. But if it dies, goes into the ground and dies, uh, it produces much fruit. The death produces fruit, much fruit. And he, this kind of dying, he's always, it's, um, in the language that I'm using tonight, th th these are examples of the death that love brings and the death to self. Uh, to be my disciple, he says, what do we have to do? You must deny yourself, pick up your cross every day and follow me. Where are we going with that thing? I'm... <laughs> I think there can be no doubt when he says uh, to be his disciple, what I have to do is deny myself, death to self, every day, pick up my cross and follow him. As soon as he mentions a cross, we know where we're going. There's only one place for a cross. And he doesn't mean carry it around you know, all day and all your life and then just throw it off at the end. He didn't do that. So we know we're going to Calvary. As soon as he mentions a cross, we know the goal here, the destination each day and, and for our whole life is Calvary. We're going to offer sacrifice on Calvary, just like he did. And we're going to do it through, with, and in him because I can't do it uh, apart from him. And even if I could, it would be pitiful. It would be, it would be laughable. But through, within, in him, it, it's meaningful. So we're picking up our cross and following him to offer sacrifice on Calvary, to lay down our own lives in, in, the sacri in sacrifices and the trials that are tailored to each of us by his divine mercy. And... When you can come to see the trials and the sacrifices called for in your life as the work of divine mercy, it's a very good sign. Might not sound it at first, but this is the way mercy happens. Um, you, you get to the point in your life, in your spiritual life, in your life of faith, when you realize, you know, there are many joys in our lives, but none of them last. The only thing that lasts is having made a sacrifice. And I'll bet all of you've already experienced that. And that gives a joy. It's hard at the time, of course. In fact, it costs everything. But in um, in your memory and it, as it becomes a part of you, um, I think you're, you're able to recognize this is the only joy that lasts. I made a sacrifice. You can't do more than that. It's the greatest thing you can do. Um, so is what we're being asked to do, because he, he does it, and we're being asked to do it through, with, and in him, um, to approach the sacrifices and trials in our lives, re recognizing that they're tailored for each of us. They're not just happening in a random, haphazard way. Um, we're able to, he, he's enabling us to turn the useless suffering and death of sin in our in our lives and in the lives of people we care about uh, have in when we have been when we commit sin when we've been sinned against there's 
lots of dimensions to sin in our lives. Um, he enables us to turn all that useless suffering and death of sin into the meaningful death that love brings. All, every day we're given this same opportunity. Um, and thanks to always, and most importantly, and there's not enough superlatives in the language to stress this, thanks to the mass, he brings Calvary into our daily lives, into our vocations, into our marriages, our family life, our work lives, our sicknesses, our chronic illnesses, our anxieties, our old age decline, our mental anguish. He, thanks to the mass, he brings Calvary into all of that. When we assist at mass, it allows our Lord to bring Calvary into our lives so that through within in him, we can offer these sufferings and trials in our lives in sacrifice to the Father. Because that's what was supposed to happen in the beginning, that must happen. That's the free act that we can offer that will allow us to become holy and, and enter into the Father's house. So we can die to self and self-will um, in the death that love brings. Um, sin is refusing to do that. So this puts the suffering and death in our lives. It's still there. He, he doesn't eradicate them. He does something much better, something much more mysterious, something much more meaningful. He, it puts the suffer, he puts the suffering and death in our lives to excellent use so that they're no longer just the consequences of sin. They are that, but they're not only that anymore. Now they're, um, amazingly, they are the means by which we can um, do the Father's will and offer ourselves in sacrifice um, to the goodness of the Father. Okay, this is, um, I don't know, did it give you something to, to work with when it comes to why did our Lord suffer and die? I hope. Thank you. Something to work, something to work with? A lot something to work with. Oh, good. A, a lot. Um, a lot to work with. Thank you. Uh, oh, good. If anybody has any questions, uh, something for clarifications, comments, uh, please feel free just to jump in. Uh, but tell us who you are uh, and, and where you're from, please. There's a question in the chat chat room. Um, if Mary could be conceived without sin, why couldn't Jesus be conceived without sin? If Mary could be conceived without sin, well, and, well, he was. I mean, they both were. But he was, um, you know, to be human, you have to receive uh, the way things are now. You know, since the fall was different in, in uh, at creation, but um the way things are now to be uh, genuinely human and not just pretending to be not just putting on a man suit you have to have a mother you have to be conceived by a mother he's and a father his father though is god the father so he is a he's receiving his human nature from his mother and normally like with all the rest of us with everybody else when we receive our nature from our human parents um, we're receiving the original sin in it so um, her unique conception, Our Lady's unique conception, um, the way she is redeemed in anticipation and does not have original sin, when he, when our Lord uh, receives his nature from her, it's that it's the genuine human nature, but not but without the sin in it. Um, so he is being conceived without sin. They, Thank you. They both are, I guess, in different ways. It's they're not in the same way. Um, it's they're not, but they don't need to be in the same way. But in both cases, you have both of them being conceived without original sin. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else like uh, tell us who you are, where you're from, Rainy? Uh, um, yes, Dr. Dr. Haggerty. Uh, this is Dave Rovner. I remember uh, you, David Rovner. <laughs> uh, so I was one of your students years ago. 
actually yeah. almost 20 years ago. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, sin, suffering, and death it seems to be a necessary element of our redemption and our participation in it. But it makes me feel like our lives are nothing but martyred duty. And it doesn't seem like a very happy life. What's your <laughs> viewpoint on dying to self to participate in the redemptive work of Jesus and still be happy rather than just doing martyr duty? <laughs> I like that expression. That's it. It's, a, it's worthless, martyr duty. No martyr ever saw his martyrdom as a duty. Well, who was ever more uh, joyful than martyrs and saints? In the early uh, uh, centuries of the church, when martyrdom was common, um, they were, they, you know, how they, that expression, the, the blood of the martyrs is a seed of Christians. They, they were so remarkable. They went to their martyrdom uh, singing and praising God and re demanding that people don't stop them from uh, from undergoing this uh, martyrdom that it looks like it's inevitable. Um, they're the happiest people you're going to meet. And the saints, too, even the ones who aren't martyrs in the red sense. Uh, I think they're all martyrs in the in either if, if not red, then white. I, th I think that's not an option. Um, and and that if you're hearing, you know, this um, death that love brings and the and the death to self, if you want to hear that in terms of martyrdom, that would be very correct. Um, but the way you're when you're using a in the sense of duty, I mean, I, I think of duty as a very positive thing, but it, I think it's not always viewed that way. The, the expression that you use made it sound, um, you know, owner, own, onerous. So um, I guess the, the answer to it is it comes down to uh, the person's um, um, life of faith and, or, and particularly their spiritual life and the, um, the realness of their, how really in love they are with our Lord, I think would probably make the difference between um, martyred duty, as you put it, and you know, glorious martyrdom um, as Sorry. a duty of their state. Right. The saints don't seem to ha experience it the way you described it. Our, and our Lord himself didn't manifest it that. He says, there is a baptism I have to undergo. And he, and he, wasn't, he wasn't talking about the Jordan. He was talking about Calvary. <laughs> and I longed to undergo it. He was longing for his uh, sacrifice on the cross. Um, so apparently there is, um, you know, a different attitude that is available. And I, and I, I do think that is, I have found it to be true that the joys are fleeting. You know, everybody, of course, at, you, at first you want, not only at first, it's, it's a constant thing. You're, you're more drawn to the joy, but they don't last. And that's part of, um, you know, we all experience that. We want them to last and they don't last. And it, uh, it does turn out that the only joy that really does last is having made a sacrifice. It, that can't be taken away. And you eventually you come to realize what a gift it was. And even if you didn't do it well, because <laughs> they can be really hard. But, um, you know, if insofar as any kind of sacrifice was offered, you're going to find it's the it's the only thing you're going to point to a, of meaning in your life. Anything done well is going to involve a sacrifice. Any vocation um, done well is going to necessitate sacrifice. Like St. Paul says, it's the running the race and competing and the sacrifice is the winning, I suppose. I suppose so, yeah. Thank that, you, Doc. Yeah, sure. A, a per, per perspective. And as you say, the joy doesn't always last. We heard that the gospel this past weekend with the transfiguration. And yeah, then you go back that's down right. The that's Rainy, right. You had your hand. Pardon me? Rainy. Hi, uh, Rainy Quinlan. I'm a parishioner at St. Augustine. And 
Um, Dr. Haggerty, you, you mentioned early on that, you know, we, we don't choose heaven, but we may, but we have to lay down, we, we have to, one has to lay down one's life to attain heaven. And that was repeated. And we got, you, you got to the death that love brings, which, as I understand, is a sacrifice, the uh, uh, acts of love and trust in the Father. And then you mentioned how Jesus said, you know, you, you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me every day. So I was thinking, so what does it mean, number one, to lay down one's life? And what are examples of things that we could do every day that would fulfill that? Well, at this point, I think it becomes particular to each person, what each person has in their life, what he's, um, I don't think you can give a general answer to it, but, um, you know, um, if you have any other, if you have a family, <laughs> first of all, um, you know, they constitute the neighbor that our Lord spoke about, they're difficult. Um, they make demands. Um, there's a lot of, I find, a lot of conflict of wills going on among people and um, wherever there's a group of people and immediately with the family. And um, I think that uh, if, if you're lucky enough to have sickness in your family, that you are um, called upon to others that you're called upon to take care of, um, and I, I do think it's lucky. I know how hard it is, but I have found that you, they give much more than I give them. Um, the, there's the, the, you know, the thing, the demands in old age, not only sickness, but old age, either our own or other people's. Uh, it seems that, you know, in whatever your situation is, whatever your life entails, um, your own, um, struggles and the others that you come in, in contact with on a regular basis, I think there's uh, that's where you look for uh, the opportunities to um, make the gift of self in sacrifice and lay down one's life. Um, and everybody's affected by the sin in the world, you know, the, the suffering and death that sin causes and there's a, always going to be a way to respond to it such that it doesn't only have to be the suffering and death that sin causes, but now I can approach it with this other way to die, the death that love brings. Um, but you have to look at the instances that your life is filled with to, um, if each of us has to look at what our lives are filled with and see where the opportunity is. I know it's there. Thank you. Well, I say Nisha says you can find God in everything. Anybody else would like to ask a question or clarification? Dr. Haggerty, you alluded that there's a fourth way of dying. Right. Jesus probably didn't uh, conquer that. What is that? Oh, death by chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure our Lord did anything with that one. Right. I'm, I'm hoping to go that way. <laughs> the other three, I know he did. Right. Anybody oh, else? Is. Question, clarification, comment? <laughs> Look at Christina. She put a laughing face. <laughs> Dr. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I, I think that it's not by accident, but next week we have Dr. Joseph Kelly from Merrimack to sort of really follow up with how Dr. Haggerty uh, left us this evening. He talks about what does it mean if we share in, in Jesus's life and baptism, we have to share in his suffering and death. That's right. It's sort of a, yes. a continuation. Yes, of, it's big, of, yes. Of, of where we are. If we share in his life and baptism, we have to, why do we have to share in his life and death? So the continuation of, uh, you, you laid the groundwork for that, Janet. We're very yeah. grateful. 
That was a, that was well planned, except I know it wasn't planned. <laughs> but well, a little bit. Planned a little it. Bit. Right, a little <laughs> bit. Uh, so we, we're, we're, we're great. And after that, uh, what does St. Paul uh, mean that, you know, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, our life is in vain. And then the, the last one is uh, an Augustinian bishop's going to talk about uh, what's our life going to be like in the resurrection. Yeah. So they all sort of hopefully follow each other uh, with the whole notion of the Paschal mystery. But uh, yes. Doctor, we're very grateful this, uh, for your presentation. Obviously you put time in preparing for it. Uh, so we're very grateful for that. And let you know that we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be praying for you as you share in the suffering and death of uh, leaving St. Charles in, in Winmar. Yeah. In Win <laughs> You know, that's that's a, that's a suffering and death. Oh, it's uh, painful. Yes. After, it is. after so painful, after so many years. Yeah. So we'll be we'll keep you in prayer and hopefully you'll find new life and resurrection. Uh, yeah. From that suffering and death. Yeah. That's the right attitude, I know, but it's hard to <laughs> hard to face it that way. Oh, uh, we're all at a uh, if anybody would like if anybody would like to join us on Thursday evening. Uh, we have members from our parish and outside our parish who gather to uh, look at the scripture readings for the following Sunday. And on Friday night, we have the Stations of the Cross on Zoom. Uh, all those link numbers uh, you can find uh, on our homepage of our website and, uh, and on the bulletin. So thank you very much. All right. Janet, hope you, you you have a sense of new life from the suffering and death of the, of the separation. But thank you for what you've done tonight. I think it helps us put in perspective uh, the daily sufferings and death that we have to se we separate ourselves from. I hope so. so. Many thanks. That would be that would be um, me useful. That would be a right. good thing if that could happen. And you were, and you were good. So, so th okay. thank you very much. You're very welcome. My pleasure. You're a nice audience. <laughs> I'm reading these um, remarks.